Well, after that, there are three ways for you to ask questions. You can ask questions during the talks uh, through uh, the chat box in Zoom, the Slack box, um, and, and also by raising your hand. I don't see any hand raised at this stage, so I'll start with the question we have uh, collected during the two talks. Madhu, you have a first question from Amir Tafrishi. Is the finger model underactuated? And if yes, can you observe buckling instability related to joint constraints? Um, I, the, that question is also related uh, to Andrea's following question. So I'm going to answer the two together. Andrea's question was, uh, can co-contraction be controlled independently of finger force? So uh, Amir, the, con con the context of underactuation uh, is applicable in some parts of our body, but certainly not the finger uh, by most common definitions of under or over actuation. We have far more muscles pulling on the joints than the number of joints. On the other hand, uh, you don't have enough muscles to completely independently control stiffness of every joint and target every joint. So that really gets to Andrea's question, can you co-contract independent of the forces? Uh, mechanically, we don't have enough. Uh, there is an added layer of uh, difficulty, which is do people have the, the neural circuitry, uh, which could even be plastic, to be able to do that? Uh, I, that's a very hard question, Andrea. But what I can say is when we stiffen the joint, uh, people genuinely get stronger and are able to uh, produce much greater forces, which indicates that they were previously co-contracting, which limited how hard they could uh, push. Uh, on the flip side, we do see quite a bit of variability from subject to subject, even when we ask uh, how hard were they pushing relative to how, how much they could have pushed. Because we, we by stiffening or adding the splint, we have a golden measure of how strong could they be in some sense. Uh, and people were quite variable. So that may be a, a, an intrinsically learned aversion to stay away from these snap buckling events. By, and the safety margin may be quite variable across people or because their ability to co-contract is not as independent as some other person who has learned to do this quite a lot. That is, I think, a completely open question. I, Andrea, I don't know if I interpreted your question right, and likewise, Amir. Yeah, maybe we can um, we can go back and forth in a, in a second. Let's let's turn to Alberto. Um, Alberto, maybe you you've seen the the question. There are two questions that are similar. What is the resolution and precision of the sensor used at the fingertips to get the force from the interaction between the cable and the fingers? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, the, the resolution is um, quite high. I mean, the resolution, it, uh, it's limited by the resolution of the camera you're using um, for the most part. If you get the optics right, if you get the illumination right, um, um, you can build sensors of this type that give you micro resolution in contact location. Um, I, we don't use that type of sensors and I don't think that it's necessary to get to that um, resolution. But for example, they're used to measure cracks in the structures or in materials, uh, which was the, the original application that they were developed for. Um, there's, I think that there's a, an important related question there, which is how much resolution do we actually need? Um, I think that for um, it's interesting that whenever we use a model-based approach, we use the resolution to the maximum that we can get from the sensor because really there's no computational burden in using it for the most part. Um, but what we've been seeing is that whenever we use learning approaches that have to sort of process, uh, there are CNNs involved that have to process the image, uh, resolution clearly um, makes, a, makes a difference, uh, both computationally, but also in terms of uh, accuracy of the system. And uh, there is definitely a trade-off where too much information, um, too much resolution just doesn't buy you much. And uh, um, for, the, for the most part, in almost all applications, we downsample the images we get from the sensor um, because um, it turns out it's not necessary to have that much resolution. Um, I think that there is one 
feature where resolution is more um, difficult to get with this type of sensor, which is force estimation. So contact location um, is very, uh, can be very accurate. Force estimation depends on uh, sort of the thickness of the sensor, right? So ultimately, um, the force estimation is a byproduct of the deformation of this gel material. And um, the thicker the gel is, the, the more deformation you can absorb within the linear regime of the, of the gel. Um, and um, um, if you want to have high force estimation, if you want to have high resolution estimating the magnitude of the contact force, um, I think that you probably, it's, it's probably a better idea to use a combination of um, other types of proprioception, like let's say having force torque sensors at the, at the joints with uh, tactile feedback. Um, I think it, it will be difficult to rely on accurate force estimates uh, on the fingertips um, in general. Right. Um, given that we have only 10 minutes for, for q and A. I, I'm sorry to have to ask to be super brief, if, if at all possible, in the question and answer. Um, but, but I mean, it was an awesome answer. So it's just that we are so tight on schedule. Madhu, I saw that you raised your hand. You wanted to do a replica, I think, to, to Andrea? I, yes. Yes, I have a question for Andrea. So uh, Andrea, when thinking about friction of uh, objects, but the smooth surfaces have certain type of friction which comes from microscopic mechanics but occasionally you may encounter larger obstacles which acts as a shear force that resists motion, but the dominant mechanics there are, are often quite different. Uh, from point of view of study of tribology itself, it's fascinating to be able to tell apart what are the dominant modes, uh, but also from point of view of manipulation. So my question is, with your pose and contact estimation with the sensor, are you typically able to tell these apart? Is there value to even doing that in the context of uh, these, these manipulation tasks you're imagining? Is that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> um, I, Sorry, I said Andrea. I, 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 my no, 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 no. <laughs> um, I mean, you can... I mean, you can observe some of those protrusions. Um, some of... You can observe ruggedness. You can observe... Um, small uh, imperfections in the surface. I think that uh, maybe I'll focus on the on the last part of your question. Do we need that? Do we is that observing that is that useful for manipulation? Um, I think that to zero order it's not. To first order, I think it's probably not either. Um, maybe it is important to second order uh, when you want to get very very high accurate. So if you want to do uh, contact juggling, right? Like in your initial videos, uh, you probably want to be able to observe those small um, irregularities. Um, for most of what we do, I think that uh, we don't rely on that. Very nice. I will have to break that conversation. Um, Alberto, you have a couple more uh, questions that are related to some of the answers that you've given. You may want to follow up uh, directly on chat. Yeah.